And now the moral maze introduced by Michael Burke. Good evening. I got back this morning from a longish documentary filming trip in the United States. It had the impact it always does. I love it, mostly. But there are aspects of American life that are less impressive, and in as much as they might foreshadow the future of our own society, worrying. Chief among these is the banality of public discourse, especially on television. News programmes I used to admire now barely mention events outside their own country, or issues of any complexity at all. The richest and most dynamic cultural organisations on earth spend their fortunes and exhaust their energies on gossip of the feeblest kind about transient celebrities and a national obsession with their own health. The mood is sentimental, the language portentous but empty and often without meaning at all. Television's a matter of pushing buttons on both sides of the screen and as many and as quickly as possible. Dumbing down, it's called by those who see our own cultural life threatened by similar forces, technical advance, market pressure, shorter attention spans. They say the trivial is swamping the profound in every art form. And this weekend there's a big conference in London to argue about it all. Because there is another view, that the cultural elite is merely mourning the loss of its paternalistic control over what others can see and hear, that this is democracy, and anyway, popular culture has its own values and energises the arts in general. It's a debate about objective and subjective merit, about accessibility and exclusiveness. To borrow the conference's title, are we dumbing down or wising up? What's wrong with cultural elitism? Our moral maze, live tonight with our regular panel, Janet Daly of the Daily Telegraph, Dr David Starkey, the constitutional historian, Dr David Cook, the medical ethicist from Oxford, and Professor Ian Hargreaves, the journalist, commentator and academic. Ian. Well, in my experience, those who scream loudest that our whole culture is dumbing down tend to be talking about some tiny bit of the culture they really care about, whether that's the Times newspaper or, dare I say it, the Daily Telegraph, both commercial products struggling in a declining market and fighting for readers. And yes, less serious than they were. But against that, you have to put the fact that we uh, publish in Britain twice as many books as 10 years ago, three times as 20 years ago. We have the internet, which is both an electronic Bodleian library and an open sewer. It's a cultural marketplace where we can still have elites, we can even still belong to them, but not many of us really want to live on the top of Mount Olympus all the time. Janet Daly. Well, in the British incarnation, junk culture seems to have so much to do with inverted snobbery, a, a kind of intellectual slumming by well-educated people who think in their decadent, privileged way that the uneducated and deprived are somehow more real or more alive than the people they've always known. There's a, a fascination with the exotic, with the cultural rough trade with whom you weren't allowed to mix in your childhood and adolescence. So all the principles of high cultural achievement have to be overturned. The provincial is to be valued more than the metropolitan Emotion has to be elevated over reason. Unskilled spontaneity gets more praise than structured, thoughtful, artistic creativity. Carried to its obvious conclusion, this is the triumph of ignorance and mindlessness and the negation of culture. David Starkey, I can hear you saying, yes, Janet, and it's called democracy, <laughs> in those scathing cadences for which you're famous. I have nothing further to say. <laughs> Thank you, David Cook. Well, a multicultural society is not just about a variety of races and religions, but also about different cultural perspectives. There's much to celebrate in popular culture, but the danger is in the values that it embodies. I think the barbarians are not just at the gate, but in the very heart of society. And we're surrounded by the philosophies of emotivism, pragmatism and utility, where what matters is subjectivity, not objectivity, information, not knowledge, skills, not wisdom, style, not content and hype not substance. Panel, thanks very much indeed. Our first witness is Alan Yentob, who's director of television for the BBC, of course. Alan, there's, uh, there's always been a tension between the BBC as a, or the, cultural standard bearer for the nation and the BBC as a competitor in a very competitive marketplace. Uh, but do you accept the criticism that BBC One in particular is becoming progressively less intellectually, culturally, experimentally challenging? I genuinely don't believe that, no. Uh, and uh, I, I think that it, clearly the, the glory of the BBC is that it isn't marginal to people's lives. It's there for everyone. There are public service broadcasters around the world who cater to a minority, if you like. But the thing about the BBC, it is about improving the quality of life, providing a service for everyone, uh, which, which does improve that. And I think, you know, you only have to look at Radio 3, Radio, radio you know, the, the radio services and the contribution to the music making in Britain is just one example of it. So I don't think that's true. And in the... The kind of hysteria about uh, about about all this, or the or the fun that uh, journalists like to have with with the <coughs> dumbing down issue, I don't think we really look at the facts. Now there are, there is good and there is bad. There always has been. But for instance, look at the way that television 
uh, the BBC television and actually BBC One introduced the, the, the costume, the, the classic drama back into the mainstream of television from, uh, you know, from basically from Middlemarch to Vanity Fair to Pride and Prejudice to Our Mutual Friend. A whole new generation discovered uh, the classic text for themselves. And, and that's one example. But, I can genuinely point to others. But well, actually, I'm, I'll stop there because I uh, declare an interest. Janet Daly. <laughs> You mentioned uh, the importance of the BBC serving everyone. Um, there are rumours, have been for a long time, that there are executives in the BBC who believe that the corporation is super-serving the educated middle class. Do you think that? I know this is a hobby horse of yours, Janet, <laughs> super-serving the educated middle class. I, I, I absolutely... First of all, I think it's perfectly legitimate for the BBC to say we need to ensure that we reach everybody, that the BBC is not just for an educated middle class. And essentially, we do provide plenty of programmes for them, and we will carry on providing more and more. What we want to make sure is, whether it's a news service, for instance, or anything else, uh, that we find a way of reaching everyone in an appropriate way. Now, for instance, one of the things the BBC did with Radio 5 Live was to try to address uh, an audience who wouldn't otherwise perhaps uh, listen to its new service in the same way. So it delivered a sports and news service, and everyone says that's been a, a brilliant innovation. So I'm not complacent about this. I think clearly a lot of people uh, in the BBC are middle class, and they make programmes which, uh, which, uh, which appeal to, to those people. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> apologising for it, but I think it's very, very important that we represent all those interests yeah. and, uh, and not apropos just the middle of, classes. Apropos of serving all the interests, do you think that it's ever possible for the mass media to proactively, if you like, coarsen public taste, that in the, in, in the pursuit of taste other than the middle-class educated audience, you might actually be leading downwards. Well, you say proactively, you, it's a sort of rather... It, it, that's a sort of cynical view, you mean? You say we would say try to coarsen public Not taste. Not try to. No, I mean, if you say, would we like to ensure that our dramas are inhabited by all kinds of people, for, and not just by middle-class people and middle-class values? Yes, but having said that, I don't see any evidence of it. I've just described to you well, one example. Let me describe another about braining up, if we're talking about it. There's been a genre of programmes, like business programmes, it's been very difficult to, to make them and to, to get the public engaged with them. Ian would know about this. And the BBC recently, I think, in the most adventurous way, has just delivered a series of, of programme formats which have really managed to do that. A, a show, show that you may have seen called Blood on the Carpet recently, Trouble on the Top, on this week. Look at the fact that even this week as I talk, Peter Taylor, another sequence in Peter Taylor's magnificent series about Northern, about Northern Ireland. He's doing The Loyalists this week. But, Alan, you know that, that mainly the criticisms of this kind are directed toward light entertainment. And do you ever feel that there's perhaps a patronising... Yeah, well, but that perhaps there's a patronising attitude toward the audience for light entertainment. And, in effect, almost a self-conscious desire to create something that is uh, so antithetical to the middle-class educated product what that it underestimates. About, I'm talking about the sort of... Well, the lottery programmes, the, uh, you know, the, the sort of um, light entertainment programmes which seem to be almost a caricature of not middle class, not educated taste. Well, first of all, I think lots of people, you know, buy lottery tickets and the, the programme itself it essentially involves a performance and a drawing of a lottery ticket. If you're talking about other things, I think it's, entertainment is a difficult area because mass entertainment, <coughs> wider entertainment, is... Has, has been more difficult to achieve on television of, of late. But if you look at other areas, areas which have come into the mainstream, performers like Lenny Henry or Dawn French, uh, or, or, you know, those kinds of performers ha have, are reaching out and trying to, uh, and reaching uh, standards which, which, uh, which we would admire. David Starkey. Mr Yentov, would you say, in, in summary, that the output of Burt's BBC is more democratic than the output of Reith's BBC? Um, I don't know that I would want to be kind of drawn on that, that question. What I do think is that... Forgive you know, me, I'm asking you the question. Right, OK. Well, put it this way, I think that the BBC reaches... Um, uh, it still reaches about 90% of all viewers and listeners, and I think that we have a, a more... The range of our services certainly has wider and broader appeal than Reith could have achieved. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, I see myself as a Reithian. I think John Burt thinks he's a Reithian, frankly. So uh, I don't think he would see some division between his aspiration and, but, and, uh, uh, sorry, and John Reith. isn't there a slight problem here? I mean, Reith's announcers are dressed in white tie. There was a standard accent. Do I there believe I'm listening to you? Yes, well, then the answer is yes. There was we are a, a more democratic... Okay. Right. There was okay, also... Uh, so so we've actually, we're actually moving a little further I didn't know we line. were back to the white time. No, world. no, I'm no. just... Uh, I'm, uh, can, can I interrupt you uh, just a second? Can I just get... Uh, can I please just take... So, Are we then saying that Bert also shares the view of Reith? 
of knowing what culture is and believing that people should be educated into it. I think he does, but I don't think he sees it in... I think that sounds like a, that's a rather patronising patronizing and paternalistic view. Now, I think that Why? clearly... Because it's a very extreme view. I think that we need to... Uh, put it this way, I don't think he thinks he knows he knows exactly what's good for everybody. No. I think, uh, and I don't speak, I stop speaking for him and speak for myself. I, I but believe. Mr. Burt doesn't have these kind of doubts about management, for example. You, does I, 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 that's not, I don't think that's either, neither, either here nor there. I happen to believe, actually, that. Uh, that the the BBC of the last ten years has improved the quality and standards of broadcasting. I think that if you would have uh, gone back ten years ago to a period when uh, most people in the BBC or many had their head in the sand about the future, it's faced up to the future. It's uh, and I think uh, and the future we is now, mass entertainment. The future is not mass entertainment. If you watch the BBC and if I could read out some of the even the titles this week in the Radio Times, I mentioned uh, just now talking to Mark Lawson. I said, well. Here we have scrutiny, correspondent, the Cold War in 20 parts. We've commissioned a history of, of Br a British history oh, of Simon Sharma. Adam, take that as read, but yes. of course that's the point, isn't it? Uh, David whether it's watched is another uh, thing. Can you David. just ask whether David or not Cooper. the aim of the BBC is the pursuit of excellence? Yes, and if it unequivocally. Is, if it is, then how can you cope with market forces? Because the BBC has just become a business like ITV. Please, and I mean, else. this isn't absolutely not true. And you say to me, if it is, how do you cope with market forces? The BBC has been coping with market forces since the arrival of BBC, of, of ITV when it ceased to be a monopoly. It has to be able to manage that. Do, that do, is part of the. Do you think the, that uh, there is a tension? Yeah, now, Michael it. began with that. Do you think that there is a tension between the increase in market forces, the pressures, uh, and the ability of the BBC to deliver excellence? and indeed to serve elites as well as large but masses. But of course, but of course, if we're going to... Uh, uh, I would say there is a tension there, and actually managing that tension uh, creatively uh, is, 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 is a big responsibility. I absolutely think that. And I, my conclusion, though, is that, that we are managing it, uh, you know, uh, uh, well. Would you do Who Wants to Be a Millionaire on BBC One? No. Why? Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, we wouldn't do it because we don't, we don't do... Uh, game shows with huge prizes that, uh, you know, uh, we just don't do it. The only exception we make is the lottery and no one wins that. Then, uh, if last question. If that's the case, if you do have, you, you gave that very clear, unequivocal answer to Ian, why are you so nervous of saying that the BBC, either in, in the form of you or John Burt, knows what is good and is not afraid to say I, so? Well, I, do, I didn't say that I didn't know that. I did say it was a pursuit of excellence. I, didn't, I did say but you don't that I would not. What excellence because is. your idea of what is good is just serving the middle classes. No, it you isn't. Know, or, well, what's no, your idea? Then? Well, I, I, my idea is well known because a lot of it's on air and on the screen because I've commissioned a lot of the programmes. Uh, and, uh, and I would not patronise an audience by saying that I would give them anything that I didn't think was the best of its kind. That's what I believe people should do. It's not just the, the choice or judgment of one person, either John Burt or myself. Can I uh, ask you very briefly at the end, uh, Alan, a cruel question, what's Reith in about Vanessa? What do you think Lord Reith would make of Vanessa? Well, I think uh, you could have pointed to quite a lot of programmes in Lord Reith's era when he might have pointed to those and said, <laughs> I don't say, uh, what's Reith in about that? There were plenty of them, I assure you. Uh, the point about Vanessa is here is someone as intelligent as Janet Daly, you know, who's got as many degrees as you have, who, who is actually a very, very good broadcaster. No, now, this is a programme which has just begun. Uh, we're trying to make it work effectively. And obviously, uh, you, know, uh, you know, come back in three months' time and ask me that question again. But I, I absolutely have very happy to defend, uh, you know, Vanessa herself and, and, and the show's aspirations. Alan Yentob, thanks very much indeed. Uh, our next witness is A.N. Wilson. Uh, Andrew Wilson, the biographer, novelist, uh, journalist. Um, Andrew, as you make your way gracious manner to the witness's chair. Uh, an elitist and proud of it? Thank you very much. Uh, well, what do you mean by elitist? I mean, oh, if you're well. talking socially, as Alan Yentob appeared to be doing, and seemed to be terrified of um, this concept of the middle class, then I don't think I am an uh, elitist in the very slightest. Well, I'm talking um, culturally, obviously. If you're talking culturally, then case. yes, I am. But I, I've, I would resent the equation of class, which has nothing to do with culture, in my opinion. Uh, well, you're uh, the only one who's mentioned it. I'm talking... No, I'm not. No, uh, uh, I've been listening for the last ten minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I mean, I'm discussion. talking about our personal conversation, oh, yes. not, no, 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 not no, no, what's been fine. going on before. Uh, 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 do you see British television, if you indeed you watch it at all, uh, as a pursuit of excellence? No. But then I, I, what do you see it as? I hardly ever feel tempted to watch it. I mean, going through the lists which were read out to us just now, um, for me would be a tantamount to saying I don't particularly want and to watch it. speculating them. what makes the lottery programme excellent <laughs> by even, even, <laughs> even <laughs> testing <laughs> <the> defining <laughs> capacities. Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, we're, I mean you've, uh, one of the troubles with all this is how you define the word culture. I would have thought that telly 
computers, internet and so on, are almost inevitably going to be inimical to what some older people or more old-fashioned people would regard as culture. Um, so that's simply a, an inevitability. So to try and have cultural television programmes is a bit like trying to have uh, vegetarian butchers, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I, Ian Hargreaves, moving perhaps away from the BBC in particular. Yeah. Uh, well, I was going to, uh, Safe, uh, to, to, to move to one of the publications that, uh, that Andrew Wilson writes for, which is the Daily Telegraph. Do you regard that as uh, an elite product for an elite audience? No, it's a newspaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, so, so, your, so your point, your point that it's not possible to have uh, anything worthwhile of quality and intelligence on television, it's a contradiction in terms that no, applies to newspapers as well. Particularly. That's exactly well, it is what you said, it's almost a, an exact... I said uh, it's almost a contradiction in terms to have what I was, uh, what I was defining as culture. Well, is it almost um, a contradiction in terms to say that you could have that in a newspaper? Yeah, certainly, on newspaper? Certainly. So it's almost, Is it almost no, a contradiction... I'm talking about in things like philosophy, music, um, serious intellectual pursuits, uh, such as uh, history, science, mathematics and so forth. Uh, these things uh, are very, very difficult things for human minds to get to grips with, and they require enormous amounts of time. They that, it's time which is the end. They clearly do that, but you began by talking in, if I may say so, wild generalizations about yeah. forms of media uh, and suggesting that they're incapable of being penetrated by work of quality. Well, you are prepared to allow, indeed, you, um, you proselytize about uh, the virtues of high quality music. Well, what's the issue about media there? I mean, you can have lousy music on compact disc and you yes. can have wonderful music yes. on compact disc. It's not an issue about media, is it? Uh, I don't quite see the point you're trying to make. I think you're but, trying to uh, make me say something that I don't believe. No, the point, I'm trying to make, uh, the point I'm trying to get you to acknowledge is the absurdity of your argument that you could not possibly, by definition, or it would be extraordinarily difficult by definition, to put something culturally worthwhile on television or the but internet. But it isn't That's an argument, it's position, an empirical it? statement. Well, can we look at the Very empiricism good. then? Because um, one of the elite institutions is Oxford. And, and earlier this week then, what we had was Jerry Springer speaking to the Oxford Union. And there were more people turned out to listen to Jerry Springer than uh, Mother Teresa or F.D.W. Clark. Uh, is this the educated masses or what? Well, I don't know who Mr. Springer is, for a start. Well, he runs a... Uh, you uh, should be a judge. <laughs> you should be a judge. <laughs> he, he does an, an American talk show, uh, oh, uh, and now a British talk much show, show in, in which... Much reported in the Daily Telegraph. Yeah, much reported okay. and dwelt on in your newspaper. Vanessa, yeah. Yes, OK. Uh, uh, well, on I mean, the more bizarre I mean, relationships that exist. I don't know anything about the Oxford Union either, but, I mean, I, it's, it was a stupid place when I was at Oxford. Nobody went there. Well, I'm interested but, uh, in education, but, I mean, whether or not we are actually trying to it, it do something to be I think there is a small point to be made about the Oxford Union. When I went there, it was for nerds like sort of William Hague's in the making, uh, to go for debates. And they did at least do it themselves. The young people went and had these immensely tedious debates about whether they were right-wing or left-wing or whatever it might be. Whereas now they sit there passively like lumps and listen to your American broadcaster, whatever his name is, right. or Mother Teresa. But is that Teresa. because of education? But I mean, none of the three people you named, Mother Teresa, Mr. Springer, or whoever the other FD one was, um, were people that had anything to do with what I thought we were discussing when we talked about higher culture. But isn't education all just part pop, of culture? Popular figures, isn't education they? part of culture? Don't Not you think particularly. Been... No. You see, I think that we're reaching a, a time in the history of civilization where the sort of things I'm talking about um, will be the preserves of fewer and fewer and fewer people, and they will retreat eventually, rather like the grey elves in Tolkien up into the mountains, rather like the, mo the monks in the 4th and 5th and 6th centuries. There'll be very, very few people who even know what we were talking about when we talked about philosophy and music. So the only answer is retreat, then? It'll be retreat, Ro yes. Roger Scruton halfway up a, a mountain in, in Transylvania, will it? Yeah. Janet Danish. Just to play devil's advocate, Andrew, oh. don't you think perhaps that's always been the case? Yes, of course it has. Yes. Of course it has. Yeah. But um, then what happened, Andrew? So, I mean, so what's on telly doesn't really matter what happens, as at the beginning of this century, something odd happened, didn't it? Yeah. When the BBC was captured by people like Reith, when even Soviet Russia decided genuinely that high culture should be... Oh, especially made... Soviet Russia. I mean, mm. Soviet Russia was a marvellous place from the point of view of what I'm talking about, because it, it did Absolutely. iron out um, a lot of the time-wasting. It didn't have people like Jerry Springer or Mother Teresa. It had people learning poetry and mathematics and philosophy in, in grammar school. So are we then really saying, you're, you're advancing a very interesting case here, Andrew, are we then saying that... Uh, as Plato certainly believed high serious culture and debate and freedom are almost directly contradictory. Yes, I would certainly say that. Uh, oh, so well, are, no, hang on a second, no, 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 I think you made a point please, beautifully. No, 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 please, there's a really key no, point. Are we then no. saying, to take the point even further, that the idea of high culture and democracy are a contradiction in terms? 
I think that would need a much longer and deeper debate than the time allows. But I think probably the answer is yes. And I, it, thank and you, I David. Think the most cultured uh, civilization we've had in this century is Soviet Russia. Yes. Uh, Ian Hardy, if, there's something uh, to pick if up. If high culture and democracy are incompatible with each other, um, we would expect to see, would we not, um, a pretty progressive line in the diminution of uh, the kind of minority elite culture which you are praising. Do you believe we've seen that? Yes. In, in the last 150 but years? Yes. Um, 150 years. Mm -hmm. uh, why, do you, why do you have a well, cut-off point I, I, 150 I'm years? I'm simply uh, taking a rather simplistic view of democracy and when it started to... Uh, but I mean, in, in the times we're talking about... Uh, we're talking about not a political democracy on its own, but a technological democracy, which has really come to pass in the last 20, 30, 40 years. So Ma telly Ma and um, even more computers. Matthew Arnold was part of dumbing down, was he? Uh, no, Matthew Arnold wasn't part of it at all, uh, one way or the other. Matthew Arnold talked nonsense about almost everything. <laughs> ah, but beautifully. Uh, beautifully. <laughs> thank you. Ian Wilson, talking thank you. Beautifully thank is part of culture, thank you. isn't it? Not necessarily, no. Ian <laughs> <laughs> Wilson, thank you very much indeed. We could pursue your whimsies for hours, but we better not. Um, a uh, uh, third witness, uh, well, was to have been uh, uh, a professor of um, cultural and media studies, but with a... Uh, he died of the contradiction not, not, of <laughs> ideas involved. Not, not, not particularly a firm grip on deadlines. Uh, so in his place is um, the presenter of uh, Front Row on Radio 4, just happened to be passing the studio door, in fact. Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 the door. Yes. Be, uh, be grateful, dear listeners, it could have been the cleaner. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, Mark, is uh, mass culture inherently less valuable than uh, the high price stuff? I don't think it is. I think, to me, the, the answers are much more interesting than the questions. I think this often comes up in academic context. There, a lot of fuss because Cambridge and Oxford into, um, introduced television courses into their English faculties. Uh, talked about soap operas. I've always thought, I mean, it's just obvious to me that you can have a dull and second-hand essay about Milton and you can have a fresh and original one about Brookside. The latter actually tests the brains of students more, in my view, because they don't have access to hundreds of books telling them what they should think. They don't have access to Cole's notes or other study aids. You want to know how they can argue it. I've just, before I was kidnapped and brought in here, mm -hmm. on Front Row tonight, we had an obituary of Dusty Springfield. We had an interview with Sir Simon Rattle in which he talked about John Adams and other modern composers. Now, if you put those two items in a program, what happens is some people say, you're saying that they're as good as each other. I don't think you are. I think there are interesting questions to be asked about both. What you want to find out where does Dusty Springfield fit into the tradition of popular music? Where does John Adams fit into the tradition of minimalism? Um, I'm interested in both of them. Janet, I suspect, wouldn't like either of them. But these are largely subjective decisions, and I think it's to do with how you can argue. David Starkey, your witness. Can I put to you uh, what Andrew Wilson said, which was that he felt that high culture and democracy are fundamentally opposed to each other? Um, yes, I think um, the point I take, the position I take on that is, we had a good example last week, all the critics turned up to see the Thin Red Line, Terence Malick movie, first Malick movie for 20 years, so a great high cultural moment. Now we all sat there in the dark, 10 o'clock in the morning, concentrating as if we were taking an exam, came out and said, this is clearly a masterpiece of some kind, and then we all realised that you couldn't honestly recommend that anyone went to see it, because you have to accept, I think, and I don't think it's anything to do with dumbing down or anti-intellectualism, people have worked hard days, they've been bringing up their families, they are exhausted by the time they get to see that film. I wouldn't want to send somebody off to see The Thin Red Line at 9 o'clock at night after a couple of drinks wanting a good time. And I think you have to acknowledge that. You have to acknowledge that, and television does, for example, that the lives of people are busy, exhausting, and the art so they, they want, want is going to reflect. So they want pap. No, I don't think they do. And in fact, I think the if you look at what's happening in cinema, I think what's happened there is quite interesting. They're acknowledging that people's tastes are very promiscuous. Um, it's quite possible. I was very sad when William Gaddis, an American novelist, died recently. A great fan of his. He had about a thousand readers, I think. I was, I was one of them. I liked him. But I would also read a John Grisham. I think a lot of people like that. What we're now getting, briefly, we're getting films like Shakespeare in Love. Um, the Truman, no, no, Truman Show, which work at two levels. They're oh, intelligent, Shakespeare they're intelligent elements. A teaspoonful of Shakespeare and a bucket <laughs> of syrup. Uh, no, they're, they're intelligent. Pop. They're intelligent stuff, Art Jakes. Now, Truman Show is a good example. It has a plot that some people respond to. It also has deeper things so to do with television and media. How do you distinguish, then, between mass culture and elite culture? 
Well, I mean, that's the huge one, isn't it? They're all sorts of ways. But you seem to be able to do it very easily. One would be... Hold on, you told us that they could be equally interesting, that you could drivel equally effectively (laughs) on both of them. What's the difference? One would be the level of audience, for example, and I've referred to Gaddis. Gaddis had a very small audience who greatly liked his works, but they were not... There's nothing you could do to them. You couldn't promote them, you couldn't put them on television programmes and make people want them. The audience is small. Other things have far larger audiences. Um, I mean, a good example would be something like your Henry VIII series on Channel 4. They could have found far drier and more boring academics to do that, but you did it with intelligence and populism, and that's what I mean oh, by gosh, this... Oh, gosh, we can't take them. <laughs> 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 I'm reduced <laughs> to a quivering... <laughs> Grateful yes, if you'd just... A, a moment of humility, David, we can move on. Uh, David Cook. a lot longer pause for a moment of humility. I'd like, like to explore the, the kind of elitism which uh, says the thin red line is all right for critics but all right for the public. And I want to go back to the essays because uh, what, what's interesting about the essays, and I, I spend my life listening to them, is that what I get is description but no evaluation, no criticism, no reflection. And isn't that what, it, what, what culture is about? The ability to reflect critically and engage? Yes, but you can reflect in different ways. And um, so, I mean, you talk about students, I talked about them as well. Um, I think it's possible to speak well or write well intelligently about popular culture, put it in its traditions. What I object to is the idea that you would always get more as a student out of, um, say, I don't know, choose anyone you want, D.H. Lawrence or whatever, than you would get out of a more modern novel. I think it's to do with how you can argue it. Can you put them in the tradition? What is this work trying to do? What does it achieve? Janet Daly. Do you think there's any inherent difference between literature or literary works of art and, um, say, cinema or the mass media? Well, yeah, I mean, one is on paper and the other one is on... I mean, inherent difference, a cultural difference, qualitative difference. As an um, experience. Well, this problem is, you see, with these questions, you or you come down to subjective. I mean, th- th- there, there are great films within their own terms. No, I'm, I'm There's rubbish you, literature. Yeah, what no, you're no. asking is, would would any novel be better than any film? No, and clearly no I'm not, not quite asking that, no. I mean, let me get, let me not beat about the bush and get to the point. Mm. In the greatest novels of futuristic nightmares, 1984, Brave New World, Fahrenheit 451, there's a common factor, and that is the suppression of literature and the written word. Why do you suppose that is? because uh, it was assumed that literature, that the, the book literature was the way in which ideas were most efficiently and they would have thought most intelligently spread. But, I mean, I haven't, I haven't noticed that the book has no. disappeared, has it? No, no, no. No, I'm not suggesting that. I'm so, uh, that it could just that... be, Janet, of course, that the writer of, book could, uh, of books could imagine nothing more painful. Uh, no, <laughs> I think there's something more perceptive and more, less self-seeking than that, and that is that the reading of a book is a kind of internal resource. It goes on inside your own head. It gives you a kind of independence of spirit, which a passion passive medium, a visual medium, isn't, doesn't. Oh, I, I, I honestly can't agree with that at all. I think um, if you sit down um, in front of um, a film, I mean, I don't know, name a film you like. Do you like any? Sure. You're wrong about me in popular culture, by the way. Well, OK, go on, but like well, my... give me your, a couple well, of your favourite films. Well, I mean, the, 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 point, the point is that you have to construct a book inside your own head or it doesn't work. It has to work in your imagination, But why should that be better? You can still... Because you it's... won't name your films. You see, you sit down in front of a film. I don't think that's passive. I don't think any film-going experience is passive. Um, I went to see this morning beloved Jonathan Demme's... Does um, all the work for you. ...movie. It doesn't do all the work for you at all. It's, it's told in a very complicated system of flashbacks. You have to work to find out what's going on, as you do in so very many films. It throws out a associations with history, with culture. I just don't accept it as a premise that a book would always be... Mark, can I, throw, can I throw you the basic question that the programme started, <coughs> which you probably didn't even hear as you were still <laughs> passing, <laughs> passing through the corridors. Um, uh, do, do you see, as you look across uh, from your perspective, both inside and outside, newspapers, broadcasting and, uh, and, and, and the arts, do you see overall uh, a dumbing down or a wising up? Um, again, it's going to vary in examples. I find it odd that... Um, this case is predominantly made by newspapers. I'm surprised um, that Alan Yentov didn't make this point. The newspapers who are accusing the BBC of dumbing down have are substantially more guilty of that crime than most broadcasting institutions. And it's astonishing... If you were to set the Times now against the Times 15, 20 years ago, it's, it's, it, it is palpably less serious. It's still it's still complicated. Read, it's still yeah. complicated because you what's happened is because you can print more sections. And I think this is what's happened. This is what I mean. This word promiscuous. That's what I mean. What will happen? You'll get far more foreign coverage in most broadsheet papers physically than you got in the past. I suspect. But you will also have a lot of other stuff about the Spice Girls. You will have culture sections. And I think it's the choice is there. But um, it can appear to be dumbing down. But in fact, both are going on. Ian, a last question. Ian. Do you think, Mark, that it is that we need to be uh, more attentive? 
conservative than we used to be about hanging on to these high points, these elite forms in this very vigorous marketplace? Is there, are they more in danger now? You're not conceding that they've gone. Are they more in danger than they yeah, were? Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think I mean, publishing is a good example of this. I mean, clearly there are novelists like, say, Stanley Middleton, who has, who has a small but devoted audience, publishes a novel a year for 30 years. I think that's going to be virtually impossible to do because I think the market is going so much towards the blockbuster, the huge advance, the big book. It'll be very hard to have a quiet career and people are going to get squeezed out in the middle of all these cultures. Mark Lawson, uh, extra special thanks. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, our last witness is Robert Hewison, who's Professor of Literary and Cultural Studies at the University of Lancaster and author of uh, uh, a book called Culture and Consensus, England, Art and Politics, and therefore exactly the right person to ask what we mean by culture, rather late in the programme, of course. What do we mean by culture? Well, clearly, um, uh, people around this table can't decide because the problem is that uh, at any one time we're always operating with two different definitions of culture. One is the... Arnoldian elite definition of culture, that is to say, the, the best that has been thought or said. The other is the uh, anthropological definition of culture, which is that uh, it is a whole way of life. But the real confusion, and the whole confusion of this discussion has been, is that in fact we also operate with two different cultural models. Visually, uh, the Arnoldian elite definition of culture is that of a uh, nicely constructed pyramid, rather as in the old days the BBC was constructed as a pyramid with oh, the home service of the light program at the bottom and the third program at the top. But the trouble is that confident pyramid has been uh, gradually brought low by the alternative model for culture, which is the marketplace model, which is the one, in fact, we all live. To be crass about it, does that imply a, a, a dumbing down? Uh, no, what it, what it means is that... Uh, uh, the problem with the pyramid uh, model of culture is that, in fact, ha overlaps two completely different ideas of culture. One is a hierarchy of values, that is to say, aesthetic values and, to some extent, moral values, and the other is a hierarchy of privilege and power. And people who fear the market model are people who fear that the privileges and powers which are expressed through their access to high culture, like the Royal Opera House, are now being taken away from them. David Cook? Uh, I think you've rightly identified that there are values which lie behind the two kinds of models. Uh, one of the v values which seems current in the market model is the cult of personality. Do you think this is undermining the ability to think where emotion becomes more important? Well, it's, it's certainly true that celebrity is a commodity, but, uh, uh, and, but this is to do with the anthropological definition of culture in which certain celebrities, uh, uh, some of them, in, in fact, um, Einstein, other than pop singers, actually uh, become representative figures for that particular uh, uh, tribal grouping or community grouping or nation. And do you think then that the nation, the state, or the BBC, a public service uh, industry, has some responsibility to keep a balance of these cultures? Yes, I do, because the problem with the market model of culture is there are, there are gains, there are quasi-democratic gains in that we all now, in a sense, can use culture as a kind of supermarket in which we can pick and choose between, uh, in the old definition, high and low forms of culture. But the problem is that we have to, A, guarantee access to that market for everybody so that everybody can at least pick up a shopping basket. And the other is that, of course, markets tend to uh, operate on, uh, on certain e economic laws which, which produce uh, uh, lowest common factors rather right, than so highest the public common denominators. Want, if the public want more pornography, the BBC ought to give it to them. No, that's the opposite of what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the BBC as, uh, ha has a responsibility to, to uh, aesthetic and moral values to, uh, to sustain those elements of what were previously called high culture in order that there should be a range, the a range of cultural goods. Only for the narrow elite, though. No, no. There is, there's no, no. The people, elitism is in the eye of the beholder. It is not elitist to, to, to know the results of every football match in the United Kingdom for the last 25 years. It is elitist, apparently, to know the names of every single opera singer. <laughs> David Starkey. Professor Hewison, you said that the BBC, very confidently you said, has a duty. On what is that duty grounded? Why does it have a duty to protect Arnoldian culture as well as what the licence payer wants? 
because, or the overwhelming majority of the license plates? Be because the BBC uh, is a quasi-independent state corporation and therefore embodies the, the cultural moral values of the state. And ever since it's been set up, it has had a responsibility of some kind or another to maintain what are perceived to be uh, uh, moral and aesthetic values. This is nothing to do with values of power or privilege. Really? Mm. But now I thought the state was embodied by the Prime Minister sitting on Richard and Judith's sofa, isn't it? Well, Vanessa, what do you, should the BBC be doing, Vanessa? Ian Harvey? With great respect, that, neither of those questions have the slightest relevance to what I was saying. I think it's got fundamental relevance. What is this state, this top-down hierarchical model of a state that requires the BBC or any other organisation you know, to sponsor opera or have three symphony orchestras? I don't think it's a top-down, uh, it's not a top-down model of the state. After all, we've <laughs> the government of the day is voted for by a majority, and so far, all majorities have supported the, the notion of there being various cultural institutions which are supported by the state. The Arts Council is another example. Which is itself being dumbed down as rapidly as possible. Janet, just uh, uh, you, not you, very much time. I'm are you suggesting that the state has is obliged to subsidise or to support um, what you might call avant-garde art, the, de the development... Absolutely, of the, yes. It, that it, is the most important function it has because avant-garde art is one of those things which the market has great difficulty in supplying. It can't actually well, supply... Sorry, just as a historical point, I would disagree with you. The history of modernism consists of one generation or another, or, or after another, of avant-garde artists fighting their way through to historical permanence in, in, in the face of critical opprobrium, in the face of market indifference. In fact, avant-garde art has never been so boring and useless as when it was supported by the state in the last generation, has it? Well, I, I don't agree, because in fact that, that uh, fight through, I mean, I agree that the, 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 the avant-garde uh, has by definition had to struggle for that but the 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 victory of the avant-garde the way that, that those modernists are now the canon that that, we, that i now teach as a professor is as a result of state intervention exactly and it's a contradiction in terms if they are the canon then they're not but the you're not complaining that the avant-garde has succeeded before no, you were saying no, that. No, 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 I'm saying that it's... Janet, you, you'll sorry. have to pursue this conversation oh, right. somewhere else or else we'll be uh, uh, halfway through the 10 o'clock news. <laughs> pr pr Professor Hewison, thanks, thanks very much indeed. Uh, panel, now, what do we make of all this? Do you, um, uh, well, just picking up what uh, Professor Hewison said, uh, David Stark, do you see elitism in the eye of the beholder? Uh, no, I think that what is perfectly clear that uh, Professor Hewitson himself was shifting definitions just as rapidly as he could. Um, I cannot see in an age which emphasises access, populism and emotion why the state should possibly wish to uh, subsid uh, subsidise high culture, why it should possibly wish to subsidise opera or indeed the avant-garde. Um, I think we've really got to decide what sort of world we live in and what sort of world um, the, the marketplace wants. At the moment, I actually think there is a huge diversity. I think we can have high and low. The trouble is, and this is something we have not touched on in the programme, but we should have done, democracy actually isn't very tolerant. The mass marketplace is not very tolerant. The worship of emotions is not very tolerant. So and what I wish we had in this country, Michael, and this is the last thing I want to say, I'd be quite happy with the marketplace if we had a seriously entrenched right of freedom of speech, as we don't, were vulnerable. Janet Daly, when Andrew Wilson said uh, to, to uh, cooings of agreement from David Starkey <laughs> that high, high culture and democracy, it got very cosy, high de uh, culture and democracy were fundamentally opposed to each other, and I think Andrew Wilson went on to say that Soviet Russia was probably the high watermark. Uh, yeah, I think I assume that what he meant success. was that that high cultural values are inherently aristocratic, and that what the Soviet Union did was try to generalise, to extrapolate from those sort of aristocratic values and spread them over an entire society. Very dubious. I don't think it had. You have to be totalitarian to believe in high culture. My own criterion for what is excellent in cultural and artistic terms, I suppose, is based on Socrates' idea that the unexamined life is not worth living. If an art form or a creative uh, function helps you to examine your life, then it is, by definition, contributing something to culture. Socrates was killed by a democracy and believed in aristocracy. Uh, he was killed uh, because he was a totalitarian. Willingly, willingly. He was a fascist. David Cook. <laughs> Well, I think that behind this, there are different sets of values, and the problem is that we've lost a narrative for society as a whole. We don't have a common story, and we're not able to ask or to answer the question, who are we, what gives us meaning, what do we believe, and what's important? And I think that's at the heart of this struggle, whether we're braining up or dumbing down. What actually matters to us as a society, and how can we express that? Ian Hargreaves, which who persuaded you most, and which side of the particular argument... Uh, well, Couch it as dumbing down and wising up. 
I think that Professor Hewison is right uh, that we. Live I was in quite a, taken by his the, pyramid uh, and yes, market models. We live in a we live in a marketplace. David Starkey is wrong uh, to suggest that that marketplace is uninhibited and unchecked. If it were uninhibited and unchecked, we wouldn't have the BBC and lots of other things that we have. Soon won't. What uh, what uh, what we want uh, is the marketplace regulated and mitigated by these other forces. That's what we have. Democracy allows us to negotiate the balance between those things. Things, that seems to me to be um, the least bad position that we could be in. And Janet, when uh, I forget exactly who, I think it was probably probably David Cook uh, at one stage was was talking about a, a decrease in the amount of criticism, analysis, reflection uh, of, yeah. of, of serious art, of uh, yeah. serious culture. That's uh, because did that of, chime with you? Yes, that's because of the decline of intellect, the decline of rationality, and its replacement by emotion, which I find a very dangerous tendency because it it lays people open for. Um, well, for, for sort of fascism, for authoritarianism, for demagoguery. Mm. David Cook? We must just get away from the lowest common denominator and genuinely seek excellence, but excellence across the board. And David, I, I really did, David Starkey, that is, I really did pull your leg over. Janet, it's called democracy. <laughs> but that's basically your, still the thrust of your argument, 40, 45 minutes later. It, it is indeed, and I, I think what... Nobody really has dissented from that. People have put different glosses on it, but fundamentally we have a mass democracy untrammeled by any recognition of ruling elites. And very briefly, a good thing or a bad thing? It's just In a fact. In cultural terms. It's just a fact. Climb off the fence, David. Is it good or yeah, bad? Yes, come on. It's just a fact. No, what matters no, that is what we do with the fact. Do. If it requires yeah. us all to be uh, a monastic elite with Ann Wilson, I'll uh, stick with the democratic seething mass. <laughs> <laughs> Who said he was monastic? <laughs> OK, that's it. We must, must, must stop there. That's it for this week. From our panel, Janet Daly, David Starkey, David Cookie and Hargreaves, and from me, until the same time next week, goodbye. The Moral Maze was presented by Michael Burke and produced by David Coombs. And now on BBC Radio 4, the second in our series of Lent talks, in which the novelist and Daily Mail columnist Angela Lambert offers a personal reflection on the meaning of Easter. Today I want to talk about the great taboo subject of our time, and I may shock some listeners, since I don't intend to hide behind euphemisms. I'm going to use stark, brutal Anglo-Saxon words like dead, body, corpse, grave and I'm going to talk about dying. I mistrust all those cowardly evasions like passing on or when I'm no more, let alone going to a better place. I'm not at all sure that there is a better place. As Shakespeare said in the lovely ambiguous words of Sonnet 146, and death once dead, there's no more dying then. Although I have a problem with the idea of life after death, I wouldn't call myself an atheist. The church's calendar has been deeply ingrained in me ever since my boarding school days of compulsory church going. We were good little C of E girls. Every Sunday we went to morning service and, as we got older, Holy Communion as well. We were prepared for confirmation, a period of great, if in most cases, temporary devotion. We listened to the sermon and the collect for the day. Our fidgety minds learned the English hymnal by rote. For me, those words and tunes are lodged forever in my memory, like carols or nursery rhymes. All my life, the Bible and the Gospels have remained more familiar to me than anything except a handful of great English poems. The last words of Christ on the cross which my inner ear heard as Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, not even knowing what language this was, let alone how to pronounce it, are engraved on my memory. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They suggest that in his last hours not even Christ was certain of life after death, despite the Old Testament predictions and the promises he made to his followers and to the good thief on the cross, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Death transforms us all, one way or another, into what Shakespeare brutally called worms meat, or into some eternal celestial being. I've already said I'm sceptical about my own immortality. What I do know for sure is that nearly dying, facing death as close as staring into a mirror, has transformed me. 
It's given me a proper respect, an acceptance, which has become quite unusual nowadays, of ageing and death. It has made me cherish life. Our late 20th century culture is obsessed with the imagery and icons of the glossy, taut-skinned young beauties in perfume advertisements and catwalk photographs. We glorify youth, 